Welcome back to Travels with Alicia. Today, I'll cover Japan and the city of Tokyo. I recently returned from a three week trip to Japan. I went with my daughter Athena. It took us 13 hours nonstop from Washington, D.C. It was an amazing trip. We enjoyed food, cultural sites. It was just organized chaos, and we loved it. So, on the way there, I watched the movie Lost in Translation on the plane. And so, if you haven't seen it, it's a perfect thing to watch on your, on your way to Japan. It starred Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson, and it's about their unusual friendship while they were kind of experiencing cultural displacement in Japan. And I could totally relate to this.、Um, it's, it's one of the destinations that you will feel like someone has dropped you somewhere very, very different from where you're from. Or if you're from the US or anywhere from the West, it's very different. Japan is a pretty small country, it's 94% the size of California. 70% of it is covered by forest. It's a hiker's paradise. There are 7,000 islands, but only 260 are populated. Most tourists visit Tokyo, and then second, Osaka and Kyoto. These are the three main places that most people go, but there are so many great destinations and lots of fantastic day trips that you can do from all these locations. So, Japan has four seasons, and spring is the most popular. They have beautiful cherry blossoms, it's the busiest time to visit. The second most popular is the fall, and they have gorgeous leaves that change and all the beautiful colors. So, if you're out touring or visiting sites, it's spectacular. Athena and I visited in August, and I can tell you it was way too hot. Like, that would probably not be the time to go. We still had a great time, but it was maybe 86. 87, but with the heat index and the humidity, it felt like it was in the hundreds. So, if you don't like heat, I suggest avoiding August. Another thing about Japan is there's so many volcanoes, and there, a lot of them are active. They have about 1,500 earthquakes a year. Most are very minor. But this is really a serious issue for Japan, and that's why there are not a lot of skyscrapers、um, in Japan, especially all over Tokyo. They're kind of limited to one area where the, where the land is actually harder. So, Japan's interesting. It's not a very diverse country, 98% of the population is actually Japanese. And there are so many unwritten rules of behavior. That it's, it's interesting to watch. Everyone who visits wants to culturally fit in, but it is a little more difficult than you may、uh, think. But the Japanese people are so lovely and so welcoming. You know, just observe what others are doing, but they will welcome you no matter what. Japan also has the highest average life expectancy in the world, or one of the highest. It's around 85 years. And Okinawa, which is an island in Japan, is actually one of the blue zones in the world. One of the things that's unique about Japan and, and really adds to the health is how much seafood they consume. They are the highest consumers of seafood per person in the world. Another thing that's interesting about Japan is it's just, it's really the land of vending machines. They have so many, they have arcades. Fancy toilets, anime, and they're the home to the oldest continuous company in the world. And this company builds Buddhist temples. So, one of the things you should definitely do when you're in Japan is visit the gorgeous shrines and temples that are everywhere. 
Maybe we can talk a little bit about them because that's one thing I I really do think it's worth doing a little bit of research so that you actually know what you're going to visit. Um, They're absolutely beautiful. But if you can spend a few minutes, if you're going to a destination, look up what are the top shrines and temples and what are, what is the purpose or, you know, what do they represent? It would add a lot to your trip. So shrines serve the Shinto religion and that actually originated in Japan. And they're kind of can be identified by the red Tori gates and there's over 80,000 of them in Japan. Temples serve the Buddhist religion, and that originated in India and China. And they're kind of characteristic of having monks and that they worship Buddha. But there's over 75,000 of them in Japan. So you can see it's pretty even and that both of these religions um, kind of are there and people worship side by side. So why don't we just start talking about Tokyo? I mean, Tokyo is amazing. It's the capital of Japan, and it's the most populated city in the whole world. There's some debate about, is it bigger than New York or London? And there's some controversy about how you define the lines of the city. But to me, none of that's really that important. It's a very large, complex city just like these other amazing world cities with so much to do and see. The different aspect about Tokyo is the language barrier. Since so many people are actually Japanese that live in Japan and also in Tokyo, you don't have as much English spoken as as in other major, large, complex cities. It's very... um, it's very Japanese focused. You will sign, it's certain areas you will find some menus, signs in English. But I think today it's not that difficult because you can use a translator app, even the old fashioned kind of sign language pointing and smiling, and you'll just, you'll do just fine. So another interesting fact about Tokyo is that a lot of it is vertical. You will find restaurants and shops and many things on many floors. So most of the commercial or business activity is not limited to the first floor. And that seemed to be everywhere. Even in the smaller cities, you will see if there's five or six floors, it's full of restaurants all the way up to the sixth floor. So keep your eyes peeled. Don't limit yourself to what actually you just see walking around on the streets. Um, also one thing that I noted, and I do look out for this so I can share it with people, there were escalators and elevators pretty much everywhere. Now maybe if you were staying in a small inn or something, you might not find that, but all larger hotels that are newer, all shopping areas, everything had either escalators or elevators. So, you know, if you have any mobility issues, that will help a lot. Like the train stations all did too. So it was very, very helpful. So today I'm going to share some of the things that Athena and I did while we were in Tokyo. There's no way I can cover all of Tokyo. And even if you take many trips, you will be able to do new things every time you go. But I'm happy to share what we did, and I'm hoping that it'll help you if you're planning a trip to Tokyo. So let me just start with, like, our flight. How did we plan this trip? And Tokyo has two international airports. One is Narita, and one is Haneda. Narita is the international airport that most people will fly into. It's the large one, and it's about 75 kilometers from the city. Don't worry, they have express trains that take you back and forth. But there is another airport called Haneda, and that's only about 20 kilometers. And our flight, the one I mentioned that we took nonstop from D.C., we were able, on a Japanese airline, Anna, A-N-A, to fly nonstop into Haneda. So that was fantastic. If you're able to do it, I highly recommend it. We were able to get into Tokyo in 10 minutes on their express um, train, and that was really, really wonderful. So let's talk about hotels. So how did we even pick a hotel? Just like many of you, I, I did my research. I looked online, I watched some YouTubes, and I talked to people who had been there. 
And almost everybody I talked to stayed in the very touristy areas of Shinjinku or Shibuya. But then just, I happened to watch a YouTube video of a gentleman that was living in Tokyo, and he said, really, there is the train line. It's called the JR Yamanote line, and it's a circle, and it's right in the center of Tokyo. And he said, stay anywhere on that train line, because that's where all the tourist things are close to, and that's the center of the action. And you're probably much better off not staying in the most popular areas. So we did that. We actually went on a go to looked up, I, I looked at that JR Yamanote line, and you can see all the major and minor stations, and I just started uh, looking at hotels, and I found the Mitsui Garden Hotel, and it was in Shinagawa City, fantastic place, it was about a hundred, little under a hundred dollars a night, breakfast was included, and it was a four and a half star hotel, it was beautiful, three minute walk from the train station, and we were so happy to be staying there because it was busy and crazy everywhere. And to come back to that quieter area and walk around and have more local meals and stuff was fun. So that's a good tip. You don't have to stay in the busiest areas anywhere on the JR Yamanote line works. So let's talk about what do you want to do when you're there. So As I said, there were several very busy areas that have a lot of tourist attractions. And one of those is Shibuya, where some people do stay. But to me, people compare it to Times Square. And as I've told people, I would never want to stay in Times Square either. It's a lot of bright lights and action. And it's kind of the Tokyo of your expectations. This is where they do have high rises. And you know, the ground, the ground is harder and they can build those there. The most important and most famous thing is the Shibuya Scramble Crossing. And this is nothing more than a crosswalk, but 3,000 people cross at once. It's the largest crossing in the world and people love to go there and be part of that crossing of those streets. And you can go up, there's something called the Shibuya Scramble Shopping area and restaurants and it has I don't know many 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 floors you can go up and you can even watch it from some of those floors where they're shopping and restaurants sit in the restaurants and look down so that's something really fun to do and they also have something that's relatively new it's Shibuya 109 and it's a shopping area too but it's much younger and hip so you can definitely see a difference between the Shibuya Scramble Shopping and the Shibuya 109. Much younger people, um, but fun to look around. I really enjoyed it. There's also something called Shibuya Parko, and that has the largest Nintendo store right there. So you, if you have a fan of that in your family. One of the other things I want to mention about this area is they do have something called Center Guy Street, J. G-A-I, and this is where there's not sky rises. This is actually more like, gives you a more characteristic feeling of restaurants, bars, and shopping, and it feels more um, like an older Tokyo feel. So that's kind of fun to see if you're in that area. The last thing I'll mention in Shibuya is they have the largest Don Quixote. They call it the Mega Donkey. And this is a famous store in Japan it's seven floors. It's open 24 hours a day. It's where everyone goes to get all the souvenirs and gifts that you want to bring home that, that aren't super like homemade or upscale. But it, they, they have everything. They have the largest selection of Kit Kats in anywhere in Japan. It's a, it's a sight to be seen. You'll find it no matter where you're staying in Tokyo. I'm sure there'll be one close, but the largest one is in Shibuya. So if you go north of Shibuya, the next stop is called Harajuku, and this stop has two important things that you might want to see. One is the Meiji Jinjuko Shrine, and it's just very convenient. If you get off the train, there'll be signs to it, and it's literally steps from the train station, so it was very easy to visit. 
and it had huge like park like feel like when you were walking up to the shrine it was like a major road that was just gravel and people were walking up it so it was really beautiful and there's the sake barrels that were outside and there was a lot of history of sake making in this area and it was worth you know taking time and looking at all all of that as well there's also a park and it's called yoyogi park and it's also right next to the shrine. It's almost connected. I didn't go in it. People said it's very beautiful. But the shrine itself feels like it's in a park. So I just walked around that area instead. But it's worth a stop. So definitely go to Harajuku, right right next to or one stop north of um, Shibuya. The next area is one more stop north. It's called Shinjuku. And this one is where they have the National Garden. And it was, this was what we did on our first day. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, again, we were a little too hot, but they have a beautiful, nice tea house where you can take off your shoes and there's bamboo mats. It was air conditioned. And we, instead of getting tea, we ended up getting shaved ice. And it was the best shaved ice of our whole trip. It was very upscale with like fresh white peaches all over it. Absolutely wonderful. This garden is gorgeous. I mean, they have temples in there as well that you can see, but the gardens are all manicured and landscaped so beautifully. So I highly recommend that. Another area in Tokyo that we visited, but I've heard it's not on everyone's list to go there. It's Obadiah. And this is a man-made island in the Tokyo Bay. What pulled us to this area is I wanted to see the digital art show. It's called Team Lab Planet. And there's so much of this on the internet. People like recording it. It is, it's an amazing show. I mean, I think it had like five different um, displays. And um, you would go through, one of it was like you were walking through two feet of water and there was and it was digital art. It was um, projection, but like fish swimming between your legs. There was a room with mirrors and there was fresh flowers dangling from strings, orchids, and they would go up and down as you're walking through. These, these art exhibits were just absolutely breathtaking. You have to get tickets for it and you definitely need to get them in advance because I've heard there have been a lot of disappointed people who show up and th- there's just no tickets available for like the week they're there. So that was the only thing I bought tickets to before I went to Japan. So I was really happy I did it. But close by, there's also so many things to do. We went to Seaside Park and this is gorgeous and they have a Statue of Liberty. So weird. Like, We have a Statue of Liberty in New York, and I didn't realize there's many Statues of Liberty. I guess we're not special. France gave them to other countries as well, and they have, they put theirs in a seaside park, and it looks exactly like our Statue of Liberty, and it's huge, and it was very interesting to find it and take pictures, and that was just something I didn't expect. The other thing that's there is something called Dex Tokyo Beach. It's like a four-story, like, shopping area, but it's not like shopping that you and I would, you know, will come to mind. Um, it is, like, one of the floors had old-fashioned games. And when I say old-fashioned, imagine, like, areas where they have, like, little brown paper bags with strings tied to them with numbers, like 1 through 20, and you just pick a bag and then... Like, say you pay a dollar and then you, or a hundred yen and you get your bag and you get a little prize. Things like that. Like things that used to be at old time fairs. They had places where you would fish for little goldfish and they get to keep it. And I can't begin to tell you how many of these very, um, low tech games were on this floor that, um, children were just loving it. And then they had the high tech games on another floor. So it was just such a nice contrast. And I just had never seen anything like that floor that had the old games on it. It was really fun to experience. So the last thing we did in this area is we caught a cruise. So 
Obadiah is really in the bay and it's at the, you know, bottom of Tokyo. And what we did is we, it was $12. We got, got a cruise and we went two hours to Asakusa, which is a little bit above the top, you know, right there in the top of Tokyo. And it was air conditioned and it was a gorgeous way to spend two hours just sightseeing and, and looking at the city from the water. But the most important thing is when you get to Asakusa, it's one of the best p- tourist places in Tokyo. It has the Senjoji Buddhist Temple, and this is extremely famous. It has a large path lining, um, a path or walkway going up to the temple with lots of stores and restaurants and food. This is an area that, again, also has a, a old-time feel to it. It was very beautiful. Unfortunately, we got there about three in the afternoon. It was so hot and so crowded. So I would say Asakusa is a a great place to go. But, you know, if you're there in very nice weather, wonderful. But I would, since that's the most busy area for tourists, I would really try not to go on a weekend, go in the morning, things like that. Um, I've heard it's even open late at night, even when the stores close. So that would be a good time. But we found a little ramen shop and had a really great meal and experienced uh they had massage parlors around because i think everyone's exhausted and tired from walking so we had like a 20 dollar massage for the whole hour which we thought was great especially in such a tourist area so i hope it's been interesting for me to just share some of the things we did we were there let's say five days in tokyo because of the heat we could only really go out and sightsee about you know, half of the day, and then we would come back and and rest. So uh, again, August, not the best time to go. Let me just touch on food just a little bit, because one of the things I recommend, which I wish we would have done early on, is do a food tour. Do it your second day, maybe, like when you're feeling better after your travel, so that you can really get a sense of all the different foods. You know, we tried different things. We did the ramen. We love shaved ice. We went and experienced katakatsu, which is like a fried crispy way of preparing pork or chicken or shrimp. And it's not tempura. It's actually like much crispier. And they usually sell it as like a set. You'll get a soup and a salad and little things. And we enjoyed that. Of course, we did what everyone told us, which was check out the 7-Eleven and the Family Marts. And we did. We tried a lot of things. I mean, yes, their egg salad sandwiches are better than ours. They just, they use a very um, high quality mayonnaise in making them, I think. And it really does make a difference. I also was told that they deliver to these marts five times a day. So everything is extremely fresh. It's not like that sandwich has been sitting overnight. We tried onigiri, which is the Japanese little rice triangles that sometimes are stuffed with things, and then they have seaweed wrapped around it so you can hold it and eat it. I had those a lot for breakfast. They're fun. And Athena was hooked on some of the frozen desserts. They had a lot of interesting things that we don't have in the U.S. And I'll say, we really had to like force ourselves sometimes to go out to restaurants because sometimes we were just so hot it was fun to pick up stuff and just go back to our room and chill out for a while but my takeaway though from the last episode is that I would visit Japan again and I would probably stay in Tokyo longer there are so many great day trips from Tokyo and we didn't get to do them so I would love to go to um, Hakon, which is the lake town near Mount Fuji, or Nikko, which is a traditional, very kind of, if you can't go to Kyoto, they say go to Nikko, which is, it's because it's a very traditional city, and it's a UNESCO heritage site. Yokohama, which is a really large city south of Tokyo, but there's so many more. And so, they will even, at the hotels, they'll hold your luggage. So if you stay a couple nights in Tokyo and then want to go take a short day trip and spend a night or two and come back, you can do that. I, since, you know, this was a big deal to me, I felt like I really needed to get to Osaka, Kyoto, and Kobe. And I'm glad I did. I loved all of it. 
But if someone decided that they were going to stay in Tokyo for two weeks and do all these day trips, I think that would be amazing too. And I don't think I would convince them to do anything else because the moving around was a lot. It was a lot of work. And there's so much in Tokyo. I think you could not only spend two weeks there, you could go back again and again and always see something new. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And in the next episode, I'm going to cover Osaka and our day trip to Nara. It'll be fun because Athena's going to join me again and share her experiences. Thank you and stay tuned for more Travels with Alicia.